Welcome, bienvenue tout le monde. On est vraiment ravis de vous accueillir à la conférence Bio-Innovation. Je m'appelle Leila Benhammer, je suis coordinatrice de l'entrepreneuriat scientifique du Québec, scientifique et chercheuse de formation et fondatrice de start-up en technologie propre. Quelle belle occasion de nous réunir tous ensemble en tant que scientifiques, entrepreneurs, femmes et hommes d'affaires, universitaires, investisseurs de partout en Amérique du Nord pour apprendre, connecter et célébrer la bio-innovation. Durant cette conférence, je serai votre maîtresse de cérémonie avec Ghislaine Silvera. Ghislaine, en direct de New York, c'est à toi. Hi Leila, I'm so thrilled to be here today. Finally, we have the big day for the Bio Innovation Conference. And I'm super excited to have this opportunity to come together as scientists, entrepreneurs, academics, investors, experts from around North America in order we learn connect and celebrate by innovation. I'm very happy. Uh, my name is Ghislaine Silveira and I'm the Director of Global and Strategic Partnerships at District 3 and I also run the New York City Hub for the Center and I'm based in New York as Leila said. Uh, I come from the business side of the game but like my colleague Leila I also have a PhD but in business and administration. So today we will have a lot of scientists non-scientists, experts, students, MBAs. And over the next two days, I expected that we will forge connections that will make us part of the new economy. To start getting there and building such connections, please add to the chat your name, your background, and what do you do in the chat. And from there, we go and we start. <laughs> De Québec ou de New York City, comme vous devez le sentir, on est très heureuse de vous avoir parmi nous aujourd'hui. Alors s'il vous plaît, n'hésitez pas à commencer à mettre votre nom, euh, d'où vous venez, ce que vous faites dans le chat, afin de commencer à bâtir de belles connexions tous ensemble et à tisser des liens, car nous pouvons tous faire partie de la nouvelle bioéconomie et ce qu'on peut appeler déjà la biorévolution. Donc, nous voulons aussi prendre un moment pour reconnaître nos principaux commanditaires, l'Université de Concordia et la Ville de Montréal. Cette conférence n'était pas possible sans votre précieux soutien. Merci. Yeah. And Leila, as a result of this joint effort, we have an action package agenda today, not only today, in fact, for two days. But uh, we will start now with uh, opening remarks and then we will have following two great bio talks, then a virtual expo and a speed networking session. Wow, it's not being enough. Furthermore, around 4 p.m. we will have two workshops. So the track, uh, in the track A, we will have a, a workshop aiming um, startup founders, and we will talk about how to attract and recruit for the buyer economy. In track B, we will be targeting students and postdocs looking for a job in the bio economy and how to make a good impression and refining your argument for uh, a job in this bio economy. So while a lot of action, stay tuned, stay with us, stay strong. We will have a lot of exciting uh, discussions along the day until we get there. And to start us off, with the opening remarks about why the bioeconomy revolution is here and now, I'm pleased to welcome our intrepid leader at District 3, Xavier Henri Eve, our executive director. Xavier, up to you. Welcome. Merci. Grand merci à vous deux, Ghislaine um, et Leila. Thank you to you both, Leila and Ghislaine. Uh, it's thrilling. Uh, it's really exciting to be at this um, event on, on my favorite subject. Oh, I should be frank, my second favorite subject, because sailing is my sport and my first favorite subject. Um, a, um, you know, a silver lining to the pandemic, it can be said, has been the, the increase on focus, the increase of focus on science by, by everyone. I think everyone is starting to get it that, you know, science is going to be um, a very, very important aspect of, of our uh, social evolution in the next century. And, um, and of course, scientific entrepreneurs and innovators have a key role to play in all this. 
all for the betterment of our health, our community, and the world at large. Um, I, I started my career in a, in a revolution, revolution. It was called the digital revolution. Um, today, we're at the same inflection point with the bio revolution. The, the impact of this bio economy, bio revolution, I believe will be even greater than, than the digitization of our, of our world, which, which has enabled this conference just today, um, impossible just a few years ago. I think we, we should start by thinking on the impact, um, the exponential impact this technology, this revolution will have on, on things we call clean tech um, and the availability of novel eco-friendly materials, biomaterials, uh, specifically biosourcing as an alternative to petrochemicals. We're, we're starting to see very, very tangible digital great um, projects on, on this. Uh, with, with big industrial partners. Experts say as many as 70% of the, the current supplies could have a bio-alternative, be bio-impacted, they say, uh, with, within the next 10 years. Um, another impact is on our everyday plates because of the, the agri-food market will be completely shuffled. Experts there say that as much as 25% of our food may move to alternative proteins by 2035. And, and that's a blink in, in society's progress. 10 years, 10, 15 years. Let, let's dream bigger though. Um, we're, we're honored to have the Canadian Space Agency participate in this conference, in, in the bioconference with us in the next couple of days. Um, because this is a technology revolution which will enable the sustainability of human life in, in outer space. Um, how, how can you uh, better produce what you need to, to stay long uh, and travel and, and, and live on other planets? Um, I'm trying to make you dream, really, because uh, we need you. Uh, we need everyone to start thinking collision, um, thinking collision of, of different skills, knowledge, uh, research avenues all around bio. Uh, this is what will make um, our 10 billion, feeding 10 billion sustainable. Um, it, you know, some say we'll have a $4 trillion impact in, in the next 10 to 15 years. It's, a it's an opportunity for our planet, for our country, for our province, but it's an opportunity for each one of us. Um, the bio revolution is bigger than the digital revolution. I'm gonna, you know, dare to repeat. And um, it's gonna be enabled by, by people like those present today in this conference. So, so I'm really looking forward to working with each and every one of you. Um, you know, protein is, is the key element to, to anything that's alive. Well, protein is something that biomanufacturing, bioengineering produces. And uh, it's, a, it's a way to, um, to, to hope for the sustainability of our planet and our, and our 10 billion humans on this planet. So, so thank you again for, for this time you've granted me. Um, it's, it's time um, to say, j'en ai assez dit, on dit en français, I've said enough. Um, il, il est temps que j'invite un homme que j'admire um, depuis longue date. On, on s'est connu il y a quelques années dans le contexte de l'entrepreneuriat scientifique. Um, Monsieur Rémi Quirillon, le scientifique en chef de notre pays. Notre bioéconomie ne deviendra une réalité que seulement si ceci devient un, un effort sociétal, quelque chose de commun que partagent les différents acteurs. The, the collaboration of incubators like District 3, of organizations in government and pair governments like FRQ, um, the Fonds de Recherche du Québec, our industry players, all of our players, big, medium, um, all that to help our startups, entrepreneurs, and innovators go to market. Um, we need to take this knowledge, the science that we master in, in Quebec and in, uh, in, in Canada and, and bring it to the, to the world. Donc, uh, encore une fois, j'en ai assez dit. C'est un honneur de vous présenter Rémi. Uh, Rémi, bonjour. Merci d'être avec nous. C'est un honneur. Oui, bonjour, bonjour. Très heureux d'être avec, euh, avec vous tous et euh, félicitations, euh, Xavier, à toi et à ton équipe. Là. Euh, je suis toujours impressionné par ce que vous faites à District 3 et là d'avoir la première conférence euh, bioéconomie, c'est super. Merci, merci. Ça ne serait pas possible sans, sans, sans ta participation aujourd'hui. Donc, euh, je, je te retourne le merci. Euh, je, je, vais, je vais essayer de... On, on propose un petit exercice pour que, que tout le monde apprenne à, à te connaître un petit peu, parce que tout le monde ne connaît pas forcément Rémi. Aussi. Donc, euh, je, je vais te poser deux ou trois questions. Et, et si tu peux me répondre avec un mot ou deux, euh, faire quelque chose d'imagé, de, 
euh, pour, pour qu'on apprenne à, à te connaître, toi, ta vision, ton rôle. Ça te va Oui, on va voir. On y va en français, en anglais. <laughs> Bilingual is the, is the thematic today, besides okay. bio. Um, so, so one question. Um, what what uh, gets you up in the morning? Science. La science. Oh, wow. Réponse puissante. Qu'est-ce qui a fait que tu es devenu un scientifique? Pardon, parce que je n'ai pas compris la question. What, what made it that you became a scientist? Why science? What happened to you? How old were you? Uh, la curiosité. Être curieux, uh, essayer de comprendre comment le monde fonctionne. C'est comme ça que la science m'a intéressé, la science, les mathématiques, uh, depuis uh, le tout jeune âge. Okay. The science is at the heart of how the world functions. Um, I, I share Um, what keeps you up at night? Qu'est-ce qui vous réveille la nuit? I must say for the past year, the pandemic. <laughs> I keep <laughs> you up. Uh, uh, that, uh, but, but I think uh, having enough uh, resources to continue to live on this planet. So, uh, of course, we think often about money, about financial resources, but I think more important, and you'll talk about that a lot over the next two days, uh, natural resources. How to properly use uh, natural resources. Yes, yeah, and yeah, of course, the, the heart of the bioeconomy is about renewable resources. Yeah, great. And, um, and also, uh, maybe three words on your, your three wishes for innovation in Quebec. Uh, to be ambitious, to bring the young generation on board, et finalement, de travailler ensemble. Beaucoup de collaboration, de collision, comme tu as mentionné. Fantastic. Three great words. Youth, collaboration and ambition. I love it. J'adore ça. Moi, c'est ce qui m'anime beaucoup. Je partage complètement. Um, on, on va passer à, à, à l'étape question sur, sur la bioéconomie. Um, we're we're going to move to to some questions on on the bioeconomy. First, just a simple one: What's your vision for Quebec of the bioeconomy? Where where do you see us going? I think we need to be at the forefront. A uh, lot of things that we are doing these days at the Fonds de Recherche du Québec deal with uh, sustainable development goal, and many of those are linked to the bioeconomy. So that's uh, we want leadership there from Quebec. Uh, leadership in North America and global leadership worldwide. Very ambitious. Yes, leadership is 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 possible. We have the ingredients in Quebec. I think on on a tous les ingrédients pour uh, pour y arriver. Um, what 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 is uh, um, in your mind the um, the collision? What what will collide to make the bioeconomy happen? Some people say. Um, AI. Some people say AI and bio will change cybersecurity or aerospace. How do you see it? How do you see these collisions? Uh, I really think that uh, we need to uh, find, uh, and you're trying to do that at this retreat, find better way to bring uh, experts from very different fields to sit together. And that when they, yes, they could be biologists, they could be AI specialists, but I will even argue that should we, we should bring on board artists and philosophers to have a different angle on this, what we call the bioeconomy. So basically to use all the talent of our society to move into that direction. And I agree with what you were saying at the beginning that this is probably even a greater challenge than the digital revolution. But we need to make sure that to all the creativity of mankind is on board to move us into the bioeconomy. Yeah, I, I relate. It's, a, it's an environment which has a high potential and a high level of risk. And I also think, you know, when you were bringing on people like, like uh, artists, des, comme des, des gens comme des artistes, je pense aussi que les philosophes les gens du monde juridique, the, the people from, from law, from, from social, from social, um, from, from all social dimensions need to jump in because, 
you know, we're opening up the code of life. It's like having the software code for life. And, and that's that's both potential huge, you know, benefits, but but potential very high risk. So yes. Yep. Et, et, et qu'est-ce qu'on peut euh, faire pour, pour, pour mieux encourager la, la collision, ces contacts, these contacts be, between industry, research, uh, bio startups, and, and other networks like legal service, you know, legal expertise, you know, legislative expertise? What, what can we do to make more of this happen? Uh, There, I will say, I will say something probably that my uh, boss may not like, or my government may not like, but uh, less uh, rule and regulation. Uh, basically, uh, letting play the young generation should be able to play in uh, in uh, in a field where uh, these type of collision are allowed. So, uh, at college, university, in companies being able to bring on board, uh, to give more opportunity to this type of collision to occur. Because now it's so much basically siloed where we have a program they should need. Of course, we, when you want to do be a biochemist, you need to understand a bit of biochemistry. But at the same time, you should be exposed to business leader. You should be as exposed to, as I was saying, to social scientists and philosopher. So we have to probably reorganize quite a bit the way we uh, we train people and we give them opportunity to take risk and to make mistake because we learn from mistake as much as uh, from success. Yeah, and, and it's, um, you know, when you were first saying about our, our governments, I think regulations in, um, in let's, let's say, the food sector, uh, we're seeing in, in, you know, two countries today, um, Israel and, and Singapore, We're seeing them bring, you know, meat um, uh, products called meat to market, which, which they're plant-based, they're alternative proteins, um, but they're they're being served in restaurants today, and um, and we have all the potential to to test and try this in Quebec, um, but but the question will be how how fast will these regulatory agencies work with us and start thinking of of different ways to move ahead. No, I think, yeah. of course, we need rule and regulations somewhere, of course, for society and for common good. But also we need to be a bit more flexible than we have been over the past, uh, let's say, uh, 50 years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and that's why these, uh, these, regula these, these frameworks, we need to work with them and, and, and make them familiar with what it is that can be done. Because I, I think, you know, awareness is the start. We, we have across Canada... Um, some some amazing um, initiatives uh, around, for example, the the protein cluster in Alberta, uh, the marine cluster in Halifax, um, and and we've had the AI cluster in uh, in for sure in in, in Quebec. Um, how can we make these clusters, or what's the vision of Quebec to to create or or to animate such collisions in in our province? Well, I think we are probably there if there is one thing, there's many things, but if there's one thing that we can learn from the pandemic is that we can do things differently. Yes, of course, you have this rule, you have this regulation, you have, but during the pandemic with science, all type of discipline, more in the open science type of, uh, of arena. So bringing on board these uh, expertise quickly and being able to act quickly think if Quebec want to be competitive, truly competitive in the, in bioeconomy, we'll need to have that, to be able to be, to act quickly, to react quickly. Just think about the, the green plane, uh, l'avion la vert, par exemple. A lot of bio, biotechnology will be needed there to, uh, to, to make it real. So I think we need to be very flexible And uh, we have learned that from the pandemic. I think we still need, we need to continue after the pandemic. Great, thank you, merci. Yes, completely. Um, your your vision is um, is 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 something that is um, very much connects with 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 me and and I think a lot of our audience. Uh, Quebec and Canada uh, need to um, to to be the the leaders. We we need to, and we are a, a lot of people. We're going to see in the next couple of days. I'm meeting some some Canadians and Quebecers uh, that right here in Montreal, right here in uh, 
in the Concordia campus, we're, we're world leaders. So uh, we have the elements. Uh, on, on a tous les éléments et je, et je pense que tu as 100% raison. Euh, il faudrait qu'on montre un centre de la rapidité. Moi, je vais retenir ton, ton, ton conseil. We're going to meet, we're going to create a, a, a speed center. We, 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 um, that, that concept is going to stay in my head. Excellent. Merci beaucoup d'être avec nous. Euh, je te propose de, de, de nous accompagner. On va regarder un, un, un vidéo. We're going to uh, watch a, a, a video um, presented did and, and animated by, by Mazad, Mazad Sharifa Madia, who is uh, um, um, our, um, how, do you, how do you say it? It's, it's the leader of our biohub, our life science manager, but bio is, is beyond life science. Um, and she's was the 2020 Canadian Science Policy Conference Award finalist. Um, she's a scientist herself, PhD and, and entrepreneur. Um, and, and mom, young mom, um, just welcome a, a, a new one in, in our world. And, um, and it's, it's time for Mazad to take it away. Let's, let's watch this video and, and have Mazad give us a tour of the Biohub, a place to make your dreams happen, folks. Welcome to District 3 Biohub. This is a home for biotech entrepreneurs. We are located at Hub Building at Concordia University, a $62 million research facility that is aimed to foster innovation in applied sciences. We create this one-of-a-kind lab environment that lets our entrepreneurs collaborate and innovate, bringing all these infrastructures, resources, coaching, and business support that will nurture the growth of our biotech startups. Biohub is offering a physical office space, a physical wet lab space, including biosafety level one and level two lab spaces, and also research instruments that are designed to enable our startups, especially in the areas of agri-food, clean tech, and biomaterial to complete their products. Altogether, with close access to Genome Foundry, Biohop is a powerhouse for the innovation in bioengineering. And the best thing about it is that all district tree services are for free. We don't ask for any IP or equity. That's great, isn't it? Let's go and have a look at some of the startups in our space. Hi there, my name is Patrick O'Neill and I'm the Chief Science Officer and co-founder of Elephant Medical, a small biotechnology company dedicated to developing the next generation of disposable, electronically integrated diagnostic technologies that can interface with virtual healthcare. What we want to do is provide virtual healthcare providers and just people in general with a way of testing themselves in the comfort of their own home in a few minutes. And that's really what we're driving to accomplish. The first product that we're going to be developing is the Compact, which is an at-home test for sexually transmitted infections. And working here at uh, District 3's Biohub is giving us the opportunity to really accelerate that development and push this product across the finish line. Hi, I'm David White, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Modularity. We are an immuno-oncology startup working on chimeric antigen T-cell therapy. So that's a lot of words, but what it means is that we can reprogram a patient's own immune system to recognize and kill cancer cells. We've come up with a new way to build these antigen receptors with a modular scaffold to decrease the side effects and increase potency. So here at the Biohub, District 3, we'll be able to build some new receptors to diversify our intellectual property. With that, we'll be able to take the next step and bring our therapies beyond cancer and to other areas such as regenerative medicine and autoimmune disorders. My name is Ludovic Live, CEO of Affinity Instrument, a company that wants to make uh, antibody testing easier. So antibodies and protein are ubiquitous in labs. And it's very hard to know whether your antibody is still good or not. Current methods uh, using ELISA, for example, can take up to a couple of days. So it's just very long and frustrating when you have to do that a thousand times during a PhD, for example. So that's where we come in. At Affinity Instrument, we use this platform here that is based on surface plasmon resonance that allows you to get an answer regarding your antibody protein uh, binding within a few minutes. And really, researchers can implement it uh, in their workflow on a daily basis. So here at the Biohub, what we really want to do is assay development 
with our uh, partners and potential customers to really help them uh, further uh, their QC, for example, in blood banks, or even do some uh, vaccine development. Wow, merci Mazad et les entrepreneurs scientifiques de District 3 présents dans la vidéo qui font des choses extraordinaires, qui sont en train de changer le monde. Euh, C'était super beau de voir les laboratoires du Biohub. Euh, C'est un endroit unique, hein, à la pointe de la technologie pour les innovateurs et les scientifiques euh, en bio. Un endroit de créativité, de collision. Euh, speed Center, comme disait euh, Xavier Rémi Carion à l'instant. Bah, ça me manque tellement d'être de, de, euh, là-bas tous ensemble dans nos bureaux de District 3 et de pouvoir voir les startups euh, tous les jours. Oh, Leila, I also miss the chance to meet in people and in person and being in places like the Biohub. It's crazy, for example, we opened District 3 um, New York City Hub last year at the beginning of February when COVID hit. Uh, I was so excited to receive our startups in person here to make uh, and build their connections with U.S. alliance uh, um, and make a, a alliances for them in the U.S., but it was not possible. So luckily, we reinvent ourselves. We just finished one program um, connecting our District 3 startups to U.S. investors. Now we are working on a new program where we will connect healthcare startups to clinical and medical prospect partners in the U.S. So we are, as Hemi said, we are changing the way uh, we work and we are succeeding. But I really, really look forward to, the ch to having the chance to be in person with all of us. Mm. Je suis d'accord avec toi, Gislaine. Uh, In-person connection, c'est pour moi le mot magique que tu viens de dire. Donc, uh, mais la bonne nouvelle, Gislaine, c'est qu'au cours de ces deux prochains jours, nous avons d'incroyables fondateurs et fondatrices de start-up avec nous, uh, des innovateurs de, de rupture, et nous sommes très heureux de les avoir parmi nous aujourd'hui et demain. Yeah, and before, before we go into our second segment for the day, so two reminders. First, go to the chat and say who you are, where you come from, your background, and then we start getting connected and forging this multidisciplinary angles and collisions that was mentioned in, in the opening remarks. Also, it's not too late to apply and subscribe for the workshop, so we have to go to the agenda and join one of them at the end of this exciting journey today. So uh, now let's open the second segment for the day where we will discuss how we can solve global challenges through bioengineering and biomanufacturing. So we will start with our first bio talk that's going to be fascinating with some of those who are disrupting the bio scene. For that, I'm pleased to introduce the participants. So we're going to have Kevin Chain, uh, Laura Lynn Kurtz, and Michael Kupke. Uh, first of all, Kevin Chain, he's a District 3 alumni, a co-founder of Heising Bio. As a CEO, he's disrupting the medical cannabis market. To date, Heising Bio has raised more than 10 million investment. Congratulations. They are also the first and only company to have produced and sold biosynthetized CBD. Wow. Welcome, Kevin. Très impressionnant, Kevin. 10 millions de dollars. Félicitations à toute l'équipe. Bravo à vous. Um, je vais continuer en français. Uh, Lorraine Kurtz, uh, notre CEO à Light Macrobiota, a consacré sa carrière à utiliser le pouvoir de la science pour favoriser un environnement des plus propres et des plus sûrs. Um, dans sa compagnie, une spin-off de l'Université de Columbia, uh, Laureline dirige le développement alors de bactéries modifiées pour éliminer les contaminants euh, plus rapidement, de manière plus durable et plus sûre que les, que les, que les méthodes actuelles et traditionnelles. Yeah, and Leila, we will have joining Kevin and Laureline, um, we will uh, welcome Michael Kupke. So he is a pioneer in synthetic biology of carbon capturing microbes. Michael Kupke, he is the VP of Symbio Lens Attack, and he is leading the development of genetic tools and strains, as well as several R&D collaborations at Lens Attack. 
a company that is bringing revolution to the way the world thinks about waste carbon. Mmh, wow, quel, quel beau panel pour ce Biotalk. Je suis prête, j'espère que vous l'êtes aussi. Euh, J'ai bien hâte. Euh, Xavier, notre directeur exécutif de District 3, euh, va être notre modérateur pour cette discussion. Alors, un petit rappel à toutes et à tous, s'il vous plaît, posez vos questions dans les chats et ça nous fera très plaisir de y répondre juste après. Alors, Xavier, c'est à toi. Merci. Encore un grand merci à vous deux. Um, bonjour. Michael, bonjour Laureline et bonjour Kevin. Oh, how, how are you three? Good in this virtual space today? Very good. Thank, Thank you. Good. Thank you, merci. It's, um, it's, a, it's a different world that, that we live um, in, in the last uh, year. And, um, and it was the first big conference we're organizing and you're our first big panel. So um, it's a first to first. And um, we're, we're going to take uh, some, some time to share with each one of you. Um, Michael, I have a first question for you. Um, and um, it, it's about your amazing company. Um, Lensatech uh, was in the top 50 in the CNBC disruptive disruptor companies um, by, by Forbes. You're, you're also featured as, as one of the five companies which is going to solve the age of waste. That's a big, huge ambition here. Um, and um, and giving us a lot of hope. Uh, you're in the 50 hottest companies he invents bioeconomy for, for the third year running. Uh, what's the magic at Lensatech? What, what's what's unique and disruptive that, that you're able to, uh, to to be so well recognized, sir? Well, first of all, thanks thanks to be here. I think uh, very excited to be joining this this panel and this event. I think um, hopefully next time in, in person. <laughs> And yeah, thanks, thanks for all the, the, I mean, we're very excited about all the accolades uh, that, that we recently get, I think. Um, but, but more importantly, I think uh, the impact that we can already make today. I think uh, it's, it's been actually a very long wait for us to get to this point. I think we started our journey 15 years back. Um, and the company was, was really founded with the idea that if we want to make an impact and broadly compete with, with petrochemical production routes, Uh, with our bar manufacturing approach, I think we have to to really make use of abundant low cost feedstocks such as waste or carbon oxides. And I think uh, biology, we feel health is, is really uniquely suited for that. It, it certainly helps that I think more recently, I think there's, there's an increased public focus also on the climate crisis and, and carbon capture and carbon utilization technologies are kind of uh, more center and I think um, much, much needed. Um, but what really makes us, I think, uh, unique is that we have uh, commercial technology that we can offer today. I think we, since, since about two years, we're operating our first commercial plant in, in China, where we produce ethanol from off gases from the steel industry. And, and by doing that, we've, we've produced over 20 mi million gallons of, of ethanol, but also mitigated over 100,000 tons of, of CO2. And we actually have uh, several additional plants under construction now. In simple terms, I think you can imagine the process a bit like a brewery, but instead of sugars and hops and yeast, we use uh, anaerobic autotrophic bacteria that can use uh, carbon oxide that we feed to the process uh, con continuously. What really makes the process is unique is it can handle uh, fluctuating gases, which I think uh, catalytic approaches really have, have, have challenges with, and, but the biology can handle and also contaminants in those gases. And we can use a broad array of, of feedstocks and make a broad array of products. So we can, for example, use industrial off gases, whether it's steel mills or processing plants. But we can also use uh, urban waste that's unsorted that we can gasify and, and ultimately, I think, uh, working towards utilizing CO2 enabled by all the renewable electricity and green hydrogen now available to, to power this. On the other hand, on the product side, I've demonstrated over 100 products today already. And the first few of that we are rolling out commercially is as and always producing, I think, we've uh, That can both go both into the fuel but chemicals markets, um, but also jet fuel is something that, that we had first demonstration flights and uh, chemicals like important bulk chemicals like acetone and isopropanol were also very close to, to rolling out 
as long as also materials lie like PET. So I think uh, what, what's really exciting to me is also more and more that, that is, is ending up in, in consumer products. Um, to really enable that, I think we had to develop a, a synthetic biology platform. And 10 years ago, those microbes or those class of microbes were generally considered to be genetically inaccessible. So we had to develop all those tools for the organism. And it, it's, it's a very kind of uh, difficult to, to engineer organism. It's an anaerobic organism, so it's, it's it, it uh, can, cannot uh, take any oxygen. So as, as you can imagine, it, it's quite difficult to develop tools for that. But we can now do automated high throughput strain engineering in context of an anaerobic environment and also flammable gases like hydrogen and, and, and carbon monoxide. Um, and likewise, on the, on the process side, I think we also had to develop uh, a lot of new reactor technology to get those gases in, into the liquid so it can feed to the microbe. So there's been a lot of process development, both on the biology, but also on the engineering side. All right. You're, 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 uh... Your your very hands on pragmatic production get to get to the factory get to scale is the is the heart of, of what I'm hearing um, and, and in a in a very scalable way uh, doing business production in China must not have been the simplest thing. Um, Laura Lin, um, you you're in the U.S. There there is four hundred and fifty thousand brownfield. Um, Brownfield meaning areas that are toxic sites or, or close to toxic, mm -hmm. um, and and they they cover you know states like New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Uh, they're deep. They're horrifying. It's like a horror movie. Um, and and you're you're uh, you're addressing that specific issue. Um, how is this currently handled, and and why will bio make such a big difference in the cleanup of um, of this this mess left behind by by, I should say, my generation and older? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And first, let me take the opportunity to thank you for the, this invitation and the opportunity to join this wonderful panel. And you're right, the 450,000 brownfield sites. It's a glaring reminder that as we establish the circular economy, there's some significant problems left over from the extractive linear economy. So right now, governments are regulating the public health threats from toxins like PCBs. Government legislation is forcing landowners and industries to clean up these contaminants before they can sell the properties or develop them. Unfortunately, due to gaps in technology and costs, the vast majority of these brownfield sites are left untreated, destroying land values and slowing economic growth. And when a decision is made to clean up a site, often the go-to solution, more often than not, is cut and haul. So that means that they go and dig up the contaminants, transport them often hundreds of miles, and landfill them. But that's not solving the problem. That's relocating and burying it. At Allied Microbiota, you know, we want to disrupt this narrative. We are, by developing advanced microbes to clean up environmental contamination up to 80 times faster and four times cheaper than traditional methods. And our technology is sustainable. In fact, we address nine of the UN sustainability goals, paving the way for a waste-free future. And as we scale up and move to treating contaminants on site, we will become cost competitive with landfill making it an easy choice to solve the problem, not bury it. Fantastic. The economics of land fields will disappear and, um, and your technology is going to uh, help us solve that, um, that problem. And, and, and yeah. those, uh, those that you are engineering are, are soon going to hit market. That's great. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to um, ask you guys, the three of you, uh, um, questions to share in discussions. But, but right now, I like Kevin. Kevin, we've known each other for, for a long time. Um, when you started Hyacinth Bio uh, a few years back, we, we met. You guys were, were just getting going. Um, and now you've reached a, a significant investment level. Um, what for you is, uh, has been key to, to being able to get to, to the biomanufacturing scale of things? 
and and to do this in a, in a in a sustainable way we know that the cannabis market is growing but what made you first and what's making you scalable kevin yeah i can point to a few different things um so i mean the the biggest thing of course is that you know we're growing yeast we're not growing cannabis here um we don't involve cannabis plants in any aspect of our process um and the fermentation there's a number of advantages to using fermentation to produce things as opposed to like you know cannabis cultivation um one of our key priorities has been to use yeast as a host organism and have a universal process which you can outsource to contract manufacturers and so you know we can have operations running here in canada in the us in europe kind of all at once and have it all be extremely reliable uh and extremely uh high quality um like the fermentation industry exists it's kind of a backbone for a lot of ingredient production and we want to use that backbone to supply these unique you know new products in uh in the cannabinoid field that are that are just emerging as like really really interesting um healthcare uh healthcare products um so i think i mean there's a couple of key things you know beyond just focusing on creating the universal process one of the key things that we have done that gets a bit more technical is that um instead of uh, you know, you can think a bit intuitively about genetics and say like, oh, you can take the genetics from cannabis, put those into a yeast cell and the yeast cell will grow. It'll produce the same cannabis things, thing that cannabis does, uh, so on and so forth. Um, one of the things that we did in our early days was to actually look beyond the cannabis genome and into genomes of slime molds and bacterias and try to find genetic components from those organisms that will produce the same compounds as the cannabis plant will in the end. So actually a number of our, I guess a lot of our genes aren't coming from the cannabis plant actually in the end. We found more efficient ones. Um, and a key component is that uh, uh, if you look at just the cannabis uh plant genetic pathway for producing THC, you'll see 11 different steps to get from uh, sugar to, to THC. In our case, we've reduced that down to three steps using one particular enzyme that we found from a slime mold. Um, and altogether, we've analyzed or discovered thousands of different genes that are all related to cannabinoid production, and that's all part of our innovation and our development of our process. Um, we also have teams that are focused just on the development of the fermentation process, you know, using, figuring out what temperature, what to feed our yeast, and all this other stuff, kind of working the whole, you know, picture of, you know, first engineering these genetic uh, components, and then also engineering the process components. Um, and all these things together are, you know, have come together over the past, like, you know, many years of development uh, to to where we are today, where we are starting to like outsource our manufacturing and um, and start to sell sell actual amounts of product, right? Well, that's fantastic. It, it sounds like you're you're not a cannabis company, but you're 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 basically telling us you're 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 a speed um, speed engineering company to get back the thematic of of the <laughs> of, our, of our opening speaker here, um, and um, that that's really cool. Um, congratulations. Um, Kevin and Laura Lynn, you, you both came from from uh, laboratories, um, sh shall I say, from from university or research environments. You're uh, you're a lap to market stories in in both cases. What was the biggest challenge in 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 lap to market in in your context of life science? Uh, what what makes it tough in life science, Kevin, and and um, and, and particularly uh, in clean tech for for Laura Lynn? Maybe Kevin, since you were speaking. Um, last yeah definitely um i guess there's always with startups there's like a million challenges and every single one is like super important so it's hard to pick a uh the key most important one i think um one of the really fun and interesting challenges that we had to deal with was related to regulations around cannabinoids so that's all like brand new but like regulations got invented in canada for the cannabis industry right and one of the cool things that we did is that we made sure that we submitted to all of the public consultations around this regulation. We made sure the government knew that like, oh, cannabis don't just come from cannabis plants, they come from yeast as well. And so actually, if you look at the regulation in Canada for the definition of cannabis, it's the cannabis plant and anything that's found inside of it, regardless of how you actually make it. Uh, and they gave us like a big advantage in terms of how we think about going to market where we don't have to create our own regulatory path anymore. We fit into the existing regulatory path that got created. And that, that was awesome. That was like a super cool thing. And we heard later on that like, you know, the government was receiving our feedback and it was part of the discussion that was happening behind closed doors and stuff. So that was awesome. Um, I think the other big portion of the story is like, how do you think about, you know, your investors? How did they understand what you're working towards? How do you justify, of course, you know, 
we're focused a lot on R&D. We're going to spend a lot of time developing our biotechnology and creating something that is going to be exponentially better than anything that's out there today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, getting that from your scientific brain into like more the investor mindset um, was also a huge learning curve in those earlier days. And a lot of life sciences companies, you know, really depend on that. You know, they have to, uh, it's more about the technology than it is about just like trying to generate 10% more revenue next month kind of thing, right? Yeah. For definitely. So, so two, two key words, one, one is regulations, regulations. And, and the other one is, um, is, is think of your investors. You, you need money to get to your next phase and they, they need to relate to, to your big picture. Uh, Laura Lynn, your, yourself. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, how to scale a startup and lab studies have shown that allied microbiota sumo o technology can address a, a wide range of contaminants in soil air and water and you know many of these contaminants there are so many of them and such large market opportunities it's really a blessing and a curse right we're we're a small startup and we don't have the funds to scale multiple verticals in parallel but, but where do you start, right? And, you know, we've made the decision to focus on PCB contaminated soil as the market that's most accessible uh, to our technology and the fastest route to market. And, you know, I think that a, a lot of startups face this challenge, you know, what is the best product market fit? You know, which markets are most accessible to your technology? Um, what approach will get you funding you need to survive and get your product into the hands of the customers? Um, you know, so that's, I think that's faced by a lot of startups, but, you know, that being said, there are challenges, you know, specific to the clean tech space, you know, the, the environmental remediation space is huge, it's large, it's complicated, and there are a lot of players. And we have to figure out where do we fit into that existing food chain? And it's also a pretty conservative industry. You know, people want to see that your product works in the field, you know, and it's like a chicken and egg story, right? How do you get those case studies to show that your product works without someone giving you the chance to go onto their site and do a pilot test of your technology? So if anybody's listening out there who has a PCB problem, please reach out to me. Yeah, I I uh, I hear you. The 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 resources are limited in the startup phase, and and focus 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 is uh, is definitely the the key. However, you need to um, have those that you focus on listen to you and and um, invite you with open arms and, and work with you and give you tangible projects because you can find investors, but you won't find investors if you don't have a, a material context. So, so yeah, tough. Um, Michael, you, you are, uh, um, you know, more in the scale level of things. Uh, Lenstech um, includes, you know, plants in China, as you were telling us, and in, in, in groundbreaking projects. I think you have projects with Virgin Atlantic, if, if, I, if my reading is correct, and, and in, in the world of, of jet fuel. Uh, that, that's pretty impressive. W what makes, you know, what makes a startup go from startup to scalable company? Uh, what, what's, what's the key in, in when you get to the, to the much bigger level here? Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, I think the, the scale up is, 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 I think, something that's, that's super exciting to see. I mean, the microbes that we develop at lab scale, seeing those employed at, uh, 500,000 plus liter scale. I think that, that's, that's super exciting. Um, I think, uh, with, with that said, I think scale up is, is really hard and really difficult to, to that scale. I think, uh, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's quite expensive. I think, uh, oftentimes I think you hear kind of, uh, valley of death. I think, and, and so I think it's, uh, it's the technology is relatively mature, but then you need, especially with the first of its kind technology like ours, you need someone then to, to take the risk and build the first plant. And I think, uh, you had mentioned China, so there's uh, certainly some risks there involved, but I think it enabled us to get to the market quickly. So I think uh, we're really grateful about uh, kind of uh, all the partnerships that supported us to get to that scale. With that being said, I think we operated, I think, over 100,000 hours of uh, 
of uh, pilot and demonstration plants and, and several units across the, the globe before we got to the uh, starting the first commercial plant. So I think that that was a long way in kind of proving that that first of its kind technology. I think now that we have that in place, I think it's, it's much easier for the next product coming through to scale that up. Um, for, for sugar fermentation, I think it's, uh, there's some, uh, for example, fermentation tollers that, that can help de-risking that stage. Uh, so I, I would argue it's, it's probably not, not enough for, I think, the, the hopefully the technologies that we can see come seeing through. Um, but for gas fermentation, it, it really did not exist and we had to develop a lot our own. So I think it started from reactor systems that we have to develop um, and, and all the different kinds around the process. So it's, it's hopefully something that, that we can give back and help others uh, going forward as, as, as well. I think in, in retrospect, one thing that I think was, was for us really important and, and helpful was I think the interplay between both scientists and engineers. I think from the get go, I think we had probably as many scientists as engineers in the, in the company. And I think we've actually built our first pilot unit when we still had marginal production levels in, in the lab. But I think that that really kind of uh, was, was crucial later on. And from the get go, I think we started on, on real world gases. So for example, we bottled gases at a steel mill site and brought that to our labs. And I think the, for all the demonstration and pilot unit were in context of, of real gas streams. So I think that that was really important, I think, uh, and making sure that uh, that you operate in kind of real world conditions. Also, water is, is a big another uh, component after, after I think the, the carbon, I think recycling as many as much water as, as, as you can, for example. And then there's the regulatory challenges, I think, as, as Kevin also mentioned, I think uh, with, with technologies that's maybe not on the radar, they're maybe outside of, of current regulation. And then especially working globally, working across different countries that all have different regulatory uh, frameworks and also particularly then also scaling up GMO strains to that level, which, which I think hasn't been done in, 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 uh, in, in across, across the globe. And I think every country has somewhat different processes there that is often hard to, to predict. And I think it's, it's, it's out of your hand. I think the timelines. So I think this is all things that that one needs to to kind of consider when when going that journey. Just quickly yeah. coming back to the chat fuel business, we're actually very excited. I think we spun out uh, this as a separate new business. I think um, just uh, I think half a year ago as as Lancer Chat. So I think this is really again to to kind of accelerate the speed we can get to to market with that. And I think we have uh, a lot of great uh, in, investors there and a lot of airlines support there. That's really exciting, um, giving us, um, I can't wait to get on a plane that uh, tells me I'm, uh, I, I'm uh, the fuel from, uh, from Lensatex. Um, the, the, you know, going back to your core points, your core points were uh, um, engineering as close to scientists as possible, as early as possible, because you need to make all this uh, a scalable reality from a, from a production uh, perspective. Uh, you were linking up with uh, with with our friend with our friends on on the regulatory aspect. Wh whatever you decide to focus on, be very knowledgeable on on the regulations and and move move as as upstream as you can on this. And uh, and um, and the excitement, yeah. This this jet fuel, your your, uh, you know, I I wanted this conference to happen because uh, I want people to. Uh, to believe in the bioeconomy and and to dream about it and to uh, to jump in and get stuff done. Well, you're you're definitely motivating us. Where, where do you guys think? And and the quite the floor is open. Where, where do you guys think that the the next milestone in synthetic biology is is in synthetic manufacturing? Some like to call it. Some call it. You know the alternative uh, protein world. Um, where do you see it go as as a big picture? Make us dream. Laura Lynn, you want to start? Yeah, no, I'll start. And, and you're right, the, the pace of progress is just so amazing. Like when I was at school at Queens, you know, I remember I was learning how to stitch together, manually stitch together pieces of DNA in the emerging field of molecular biology. And we were working mainly with E. coli, 
because the other hosts, we didn't have the technologies to transform it. And now I look at where we are and almost anything's possible. And you know, it really gives me reason to, to dream that, that we can harness the power of biology to, so that we can make environmental cleanup. We can clean up these environmental toxins you know, so fast and so cheap that we can clean them up as they're being made. And then we have enough bandwidth that we can then go and address this enormous backlog of historic contamination so we can have a clean environment for everyone. Yeah, so you're making us dream about a, a clean earth, clean, sustainable earth. And and you, Michael and Kevin, who, who wants to jump in? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think I'm, I'm convinced it's going to be kind of uh, the, the age or century of, of, of biology. I think biology can really do things no other human-made technology can do, operates at, at from nanoscale to, to kind of gigascale. And I think uh, there's things that I think uh, we cannot kind of, uh, no human-made technology can do. But I think it's, it's I think there's this kind of unlimited potential at the same time i think it, it's really important to show near-term success stories i think to, to kind of keep the the kind of uh, interest and excitement in, in 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 this field i think uh, i mean it, it's it's exciting on all on all different kinds of level i mean the, the vaccine development stories this has been also i mean that, that that's amazing it wasn't kind of uh, possible even two years ago i think um it also shows how important I think partnerships is, and I think uh, probably don't want everything reinventing. I think uh, we probably want to leverage as, as much as, as possible as this kind of power economy. And I think also the interplay then with, with for example, chemistry. I think there are things that chemistry is, is very good at. So I think the combination of chemistry and biology can be very powerful. And then also seeing what kind of uh, yeah artificial intelligence uh, now being applicable applied to, to biology and we can generate data sets that that kind of uh, can can be useful for that. So there's, there's a lot of potential that I think um, will be very exciting to, to see. Yeah, I, I I've been following now biology as as a sweet spot for a few years, and and one of the things that that's been um, very you know obvious is has been the uh, the the transport I would say of the knowledge and experience of of you know startups entrepreneurs but also growing companies to scale coming from the IT world I'm seeing more and more collision between the the IT world um, whether it's AI or just IT in general um, at, at all sorts of level be it investors or technical people moving into this uh, into this space and I, and I also see this this multidisciplinary collision. Um, yeah, the, this this collision of bio with with other spaces is is going to bring us to places. I think you know, I, I don't want to quote the, um, the the Star Trek theme, but um, I'm I'm in the mood. Kevin, what's your thinking? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, those are all all excellent points. I think the cool idea that I can put out there for the audience, like maybe audience members or maybe you to yourself, Savvy, uh, in your career, like you've seen, you've lived through like a bunch of career paths, you've seen a lot of things, uh, seen a lot of companies, you've seen a lot of products get made and manufactured, whatever. I think people, you know, looking at synthetic biology can start to imagine like, you know, uh, like a, an executive at like a phone company can think about like, oh, maybe I can make the screen for my phones using a biotech system as opposed to a chemical manufacturing system. And what does that mean for my products? Or can I imagine like a phone screen that is better than the one that I have today, which is, you know, uh, the one today is limited by chemical manufacturing. Like, can we imagine a better material that can be created using a biological system? There's a number of companies today that are kind of like on that, that fringe of things, right? Um, with cannabinoids, uh, of course, it's the same thing. Like we can make the cannabinoids that exist in the cannabis plant. We can also make cannabinoids that don't exist in the cannabis plant. And those can be better uh, products, better for healthcare, better for uh, treating different conditions um, that you know can't be made using a chemical system. They can only be made using a biological system that we've invented. Um, and today, you know, we're in this time frame where uh, it's become so much easier within such a short frame of time that this is the, kind of the revolution. It's like, you know, uh, we're not assembling plasmids by hand anymore. We have robots or we just order them online and they ship faster than Amazon or something like that. You know, there's some crazy stuff that's happening nowadays that just didn't, didn't exist before. Um, so you can start to, you know, have these dreams and, and instead of those just 
being dreams, those they can actually become realities within you know months and and not within like you know twenty years. So there's there's some fundamental changes there that are happening, which is all all very very cool. Yeah, I I share one one of the things though I see is is um is is we need visions to to overcome some of the challenges. For for example, I've seen a lot of of um you know oddly enough uh, referring I think to what Michael you were, you said earlier there's some big production capacity out there there's some big industrial infrastructures I I think it was you Kevin that said that that there's there is a, a fermentation world um, it's been around for for a few centuries actually and into a large scale on the other hand I see a lot of stuff at very small scale I see a lot less of a of a you know how do you jump from your very small scale to your very large scale? I see that as one of the challenges in, in the next 10 years. And therefore, I see a lot of innovation is going to happen there. Um, people that are, are uh, being able to produce stuff that, that you know, allow the, the different dreams to go through, <laughs> through steps of scaling. Um, how do you guys see it? Um, what, what do you see in the next 10 years um, that, that is going to uh, uh, be in, it, where innovations are needed? To, to get our audience to, to into action here and to help to, to get them to help us solve some of these these major problems. I can, no, I think I it's, you're right on spot with. I think infrastructure is, is something that I think is 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 something that's that's really important to build out. So I think uh, biology actually has has an advantage that it can be distributed, which I think is uh, it does not need to have that kind of economy of scale that I think big refineries have. Though, though it can, it, it certainly can, but uh, it can also be distributed. But I think uh, building out that infrastructure and I think uh, scaling up, as I mentioned, is, is expensive. So I think uh, supporting that and having new technologies accelerating and keep going faster to, to market is I think something that's going to be, 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 be really important. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add to that, uh, I guess the number of technologies that are going to be interesting in terms of like, you know, revolutionizing how we do synthetic biology today. Like today, of course, we can order DNA online. Like maybe tomorrow, we can. Uh, uh, I can sit at my desk and I can just print it out on like a printer or something like that. You know, uh, that's in my house. As you can imagine, like where where these things might start to take place. Um, but I think uh, one of the interesting things, uh, speaking of infrastructure, is. Of course, it's been years that there's been talk in Canada, especially about like, oh, how do we create bioeconomy? Can we invest in more infrastructure? So on and so forth. Um, and I think meanwhile, there's there's always infrastructure available for like pipelines. You know, we can always find a few billion dollars to build the next pipeline or convince some politician that this is a good idea or whatever. Uh, and uh, or there's like mining as well. Same thing. You can, you know, build mines. People know how to build mines and get, you know, gold out of the ground or whatever. Um, but, you know, maybe that's equally speculative or equally as you know, risky as uh, investing in biological infrastructure, where it's like investing in the labs, the tools that need to be, uh, be there to kind of create the organisms, investing in the infrastructure that's needed to produce those new products at large scales. Um, and having that, uh, that capacity is going to be key for like kind of the future of the economy. And right now, you know, there's certain parts of the world you can imagine where like this, this infrastructure seems to centralize a bit um, and Canada does have like some going on, um, but perhaps that's becomes a much easier thing or because perhaps that becomes the next political agenda where it's not really about people arguing about which pipelines are going to build where it's more about like, you know, who's going to build the biggest bio manufacturing facility and what products are they going to be able to make that are going to kind of change the global industry or something like that. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. The 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 um, well, I'll I'll break a bit of a news to you. Um, we some of us are are believers that that we should have a, a biomanufacturing institute, is how we're calling it now. But but it's its major role is going to be lobbying government and uniting different parties to to create big projects. So so big bio high speed projects is what we we all are dreaming about and trying to get our hands around. But but yeah, it's a challenge. And 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 you um, are 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 uh, your advice, um, Laura, Laura Lynn. What 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 would it be, or what do, what do you see the big challenge is going to be? I think we've made huge progress, and I think there's still a lot of need for for governments to step in and provide the financial incentives and the regulations to 
to kind of encourage and, and promote the, the sustainable bio solutions and get them off the, the bottom floor and into the mainstream. And I think we've made huge advances in kind of miniaturizing, you know, the, the biology where we can develop processes at small scale and then move them up to larger scale. I think we need to do more of that. And, and then the whole cell-free biology system where we can look at entire pathways and, and optimize you know, the pathways and the enzymes and put them back into the organisms to make the products. I think we're starting there. We've made great strides, but we, we need to do more. And the whole interface of chemistry and biology and physics the whole modeling, like, like how does how does a microbe, how does an enzyme break down a contaminant? What is that interface between the the enzyme and the contaminant? And I think by by really encouraging that that interaction between the physics, the chemistry, the AI, and building on that, we can really accelerate our progress. Thank you. Well, I I um I wish we could speak for a lot longer. To me, this is a, a very exciting subject, but our conference is going to be going on for the for the next two days. Uh, I thank the three of you very much for, for granting us your time and, and your expertise. Um, thank you very much. And and I wish you all, all the best. And I'm sure we're gonna all collide again in, in the uh, in the near and mid future. Thank you. Layla, I uh, hand the uh, microphone back to you. Merci beaucoup, Xavier. Merci. C'était super intéressant et j'ai vraiment bien hâte de continuer aussi la conversation durant notre session de networking cet après-midi. Alors, euh, s'il vous plaît, euh, n'oubliez pas de visiter l'expo euh, pour en apprendre plus euh, sur ce qui va se passer aujourd'hui, sur la bioéconomie, la biorévolution, comme on a, on a beaucoup parlé. Euh, on a entendu des très belles histoires euh, inspirantes sur le lab to market, le scale up, et je voulais vraiment remercier nos panélistes pour leur partage. Alors, ça fait vraiment rêver ce potentiel illimité de bio euh, qui va sans doute répondre à nos défis actuels de l'humanité. Donc, euh, si, alors, un petit rappel pour notre agenda aujourd'hui. Donc, suite au, au prochain Biotalk et à la, à la visite de Concordia euh, Genome Foundry, euh, juste après, euh, vous pouvez rejoindre les sessions expo et networking, euh, suivi des ateliers pour les startups et les professionnels à la recherche d'un emploi dans la bioéconomie. Et vous pouvez d'ailleurs euh, continuer, vous avez encore le temps, pour vous inscrire à ces deux ateliers. Alors, euh, c'est à toi, ma chère Ghislaine, toujours en direct de New York. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Leila. Other extra reminders. So, it's not too late to subscribe for the workshop. So, we have two workshops. The first track will be uh, aiming at startup founders, and we will talk about how to attract talent and recruit for the bioeconomy. The second workshop track B will be for students and postdocs looking for jobs. And basically we will talk about making a good impression and refining your argument for a job in the bioeconomy. Also add your name, chat with us a little bit here, um, saying, uh, mentioning your background, what brings you here. And from there, we start forging connections that will be super relevant in this new bio revolution. So everyone is talking about this diversity of collusion, collision. So it's really important to have your engagement here. Deep breath, let's start our third segment where we will have our second bio talk uh, to discuss about how we will build Canada's bioeconomy, from genomics to ag tech to outer space. And then we are bringing uh, three different participants that will share their plans about a not so distant future. And they are leaders in the bioinnovation. And the first one is Marilee Sear, director at uh, Zone Ag Tech. Then we will have Jordan Thompson, Director, Strategic Partnerships and Resources Development at Ontario Genomics. And finally, we will have Clélia Cloutier. Clélia is Challenge Prize Fellow at Canadian Space Agency. These three panelists will, will start now with our third panel. Let me introduce in more details Marilyn Sear. 
So in her role as director at the, of the AgTech Zone, Marilou supports SMEs and large companies to get involved in agricultural technologies to successfully position themselves into the market, giving them a unique competitive advantage and also access to nearby large urban centers as Montreal and Quebec City. Welcome, Marilou. Merci, Justin. Je vais continuer en français pour la bio euh, de Jordan Thompson. Alors, Jordan, en tant que directeur des partenariats stratégiques à l'Ontario Genomics, euh, donc, euh, Jordan encourage les partenariats pour l'avancement synergique des solutions génomiques dans les secteurs de la bioéconomie en Ontario. Euh, ces initiatives visent à apporter de nouvelles solutions euh, dérivées de la génomique sur le marché de la biotechnologie industrielle. Wow, super interesting. Then joining Marilou and Jordan, we have Clélie Coutier. Clélie, in her current role, works with the Space Exploration Strategic Planning Team at the Canadian Space Agency. And she oversees the development and implementation of the Deep Space Food Challenge. Her goal is to act as a connector between the private, public and social sectors on important societal issues. We are thrilled to have Samir Hamadash, who is VP of Symbio Canada, to moderate, joining us to moderate this panel. But first, before we get there, a few words from Bettina Hamelin, Director of Ontario Genomics, who will launch our session. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Bettina Hamlin, and I'm the President and CEO of Ontario Genomics. We are a not-for-profit organization that is committed to collaboration and to connecting researchers with industry and other technology users to advance genomics technologies and genomics research in Ontario and beyond. Our vision is to contribute to a healthy people, a healthy economy, and a healthy planet through genomics innovation. I am so thrilled to open today's panel discussion on Canada's bioinnovation ecosystem. This conversation is so timely and much needed and will explore how researchers can work with industry and government to build and advance a resilient Canada through a knowledge-based bioeconomy. As the chair of the National Engineering Biology Steering Committee, I know firsthand that there is tremendous momentum around the world and lots of investment and innovation happening in biomanufacturing and biotechnologies in multiple sectors. Canada is at a real crossroad here. We have all the ingredients and you are testimony to that. We got world-class research, we got talent, we got abundant resources. Um, we need to build on this opportunity of biotechnologies, not only to find novel uh, solutions to combat pandemics like the one we're living through now, but also to rebuild our economy. And with the right plan and industry partnerships and the commitment and support from government, we can ensure that we're not only competing with other jurisdictions that have made this a priority for quite some time, but that we can lead in this sector. I want to thank District 3 for organizing this conference and for putting together this panel. I want to thank our panelists for what is going to be a very engaging discussion, I'm sure. And I want to thank all of you for participating in this important conversation and for asking lots of questions to our panelists. Thank you very much for attending and participating in our panel today. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Bettina. And thank you also for your incredible leadership at Ontario Genomics and the Can Design Steering Committee. I'm very excited to be joined by my panelists today. And we have some great um, discussion ahead of us. So I'll jump right into it. Mary Lou, the first question is for you. So Zone AgTech is relatively new in the ecosystem. Could you tell us a little bit about the motivation behind building Zone AgTech? Yes, thank you. First of all, I'm really pleased to be here today with you. So thank you for the uh, invitation. So you're right, the Zonactech is really young. It was launched in February 2020. 
uh, just before COVID-19, but we worked on that project a lot of months before launching it, as you can imagine. So the Actec has been built to give a strategic place for Actec companies to develop themselves. We have reserved 15 square feet kilometers in the last Assumption RCM near Montreal for Actec companies. And every Actec, as, uh, as you have to know, um, cannot implement themselves into the zone. They have to bring value to the ecosystem in place and their technologies have to pursue at least one of these three objectives. So the first one is help food autonomy or food security. Second one is to reduce environmental footprints of the ag sector. And the third one is to give solution for adaptation to climate change. So in the next five years, we are within about 100 to 150 companies into the zone, and we give them all the strategic levers they need to develop and market fastly their technologies. So funding, strategic mentorship, knowledge and talent access, experimental uh, places like lab space, greenhouses and land, office and industrial condos, and market and uh, international access. Sorry. So now about 40 companies are working on their implementation into the zone, and we want to build a place easy to promote in Quebec and into the world to help farmers to adapt themselves and give concrete solutions for food security in the context of climate change and manpower shortage. So um, the main goal of the zone Actec is to accelerate the development of ag technology, as you can imagine, because we know that produce food will be more difficult in the next years and we have to take action now. That's awesome. Could you tell us a little bit about the companies that you're currently working with? Yeah, for sure. So um, we have a lot of projects actually into the zone. We have about 40 companies um, and a community of uh, near 200 companies now. So uh, into the community Actec, this is the first one in Quebec. Uh, we have nearly 100 startups in Actec and planned bioproducts, 30 research centers, 10 funding partners, and 2,000 first user and market partners. So uh, we have uh, vertical farming, we have biotechnology uh, for sure, we have uh, to uh, fish, uh, pro uh, fish production uh uh inside in into um in in a building and uh, a lot more like mushroom uh new technology robot um automated the system etc so this is a, a wide variety of technology that's awesome very excited to see what comes out of those initiatives Thank so you. jordan this next one's for you as you know canada has more biomass per capita than any other country in the world and that really puts us in a great position to emerge as a leader in the world bioeconomy. From your perspective, do you think that Canada is on track for seizing that position? Great, thanks for the question, uh, Samir. And thanks for the uh, invitation to speak uh, about our work here. A really exciting panel. And uh, kudos to you, Mary Lou, too, for launching a, organ a new organization in the middle of a pandemic. So it sounds like you guys have done a great job with that. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, like Bettina alluded to the uh, our, our National Engineering Biology Steering Committee, and uh, we recently published a white paper and, and really highlighted that biomass opportunity for Canada. For sure, it's something I think that we have, and we have it regionally as well, right? So we have, uh, obviously, we're a very large country, but different sources of biomass, like forestry, ag, food waste uh, on our oceans, and so on. So I think it's for sure an opportunity for Canada I think one thing we really need to do, and this is what we advocate for in our paper, is uh, how do you convert that biomass into something useful, right? So uh, there's lots of products, obviously, of biomass on the market, uh, you know, lumber and, and, and things like that that we've used for a long time, but really converting those products into something valuable, right? And, and trying to displace a lot of the products that we right now make from petroleum refining. So that's where I think we're excited about biotech. I'm sure everyone, uh, at this event is excited about biotech and engineering biology because we can really now uh, tune organ microorganisms or tune enzymes to to do the types of conversions that we need to go from food waste or uh, you know forestry biomass into things like textiles for clothing, biodegradable packaging, food ingredients, etc. So I think that's really the key for Canada, and I think something that we are lagging. I think uh, other countries, you know, if you look at the U.S. Uh, they launched uh, also during uh, COVID the, the Biomade Consortium. It's a $200 million public-private partnership focused on bioindustrial, which is really how do you use biomass and convert it into 
industrial products. And that's really focused on engineering biology, synthetic biology. So I think that's where Canada really needs to step up to, to take advantage of this amazing resource we have. Mm -hmm. And I know that Ontario Genomics has been one of the most notable leaders in pushing forward this agenda. Could you tell us a little bit about what Ontario Genomics is doing to establish Canada as a leader in the bioeconomy? Sure. So I, I think uh, there's kind of two parts, I'd say, I guess, right? I mean, for one, we've been supporting genomics research along with the other regional um, genomic centers in Genome Canada for 20 years now. So I think that's a really solid base that we've been trying to build. And I think we're trying to continue to follow in that path of, uh, you know, supporting academic industry partnerships. And I think that's something we're continuing to try to do in direct um, into this space. So looking at companies that are in this space and how do you connect them with academics and, and innovators to, to try to move something forward. I think too here, it's not a traditional biotech sector, right? So if you look at say a biodegradable packaging solution, you wanna get consumer facing companies involved who might know nothing about biotechnology at all, but then you need to work your way backwards along that whole value chain, right? So where are they gonna get their their films from, for instance, right? And then where are the, the, the film producers gonna get their biodegradable resins and, and so on. So that's really what we've been trying to do is build that value chain and help to make those connections so that we can in Canada kind of smoothly pull through these types of innovations. I think the other thing we're really trying to do is on the advocacy piece. So uh, our white paper really trying to argue for how big this opportunity is, that the science is really here now and that other countries are, are moving fast. And uh, that's a longer game to play, right? But I think we really wanna make sure that um, different stakeholders in Canada are aware of this opportunity and how we can kind of move forward. That's awesome. And thank you both Ontario Genomics and you uh, specifically, Jordan, for your awesome leadership in organizing the community and moving it forward. This next one's for you, Clelia. So when we think about the Canada Space Agency, you know, typically we think about rockets and astronauts and so on. Um, but what what is it exactly about bioengineering and biomonitoring and so on that has caught the interest of the Canada Space Agency? Um, thank you, Samir, and thanks for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, what's important and what's to note for the Canadian Space Agency is that you have elements like food and health that are really key to longer duration missions. And so uh, for now, um, all the food is sent to, to the International Space Station from Earth. But as we plan longer trips, whether it's to the moon, to Mars, uh, we require better uh, and new solutions for food production. And so that involves a wide range of innovators uh, in the food space. You can think about the same uh, in terms of health. Uh, that will support astronauts during these longer missions. That's awesome. And it's very inspiring to see the CSA take an active role in this space now. Um, I want to follow up. So as a fellow in, in your personal experience, could you tell us a little bit about the Deep Space Food Challenge from Impact Canada? Absolutely. So um, I, I actually have two hats. So I work with the Privy Council Office uh, Impact Canada Initiative and with the Canadian Space Agency. And what we do is that Impact Canada is actually a hub for innovation uh, at the heart of the federal government. And what we do is that we promote outcomes-based um, uh, practices and approaches with different government departments. So uh, my role currently is to work with the Canadian Space Agency and we launched on um, January 12th, uh, the Deep Space Food Challenge, which aims to create novel food production technologies that require minimal input and uh, maximize uh, safe, nutritious, and palatable, palatable food outputs for long durations, and that also have uh, a potential to benefit people here on Earth. So it is a um, challenge prize and is composed of different uh, stages that uh, innovators can apply to. And so uh, we're doing this challenge with um, the Space Agency on food right now, but there are a whole suite of challenges that Impact Canada helps to develop with the private, uh, with the different um, government departments across the uh, federal government. Awesome. So this next question is for all of you. Um, as you know, for trying to establish Canada as a world leader in, in, this, in the bioeconomy, that's gonna take a dynamic and collaborative ecosystem to do that. Um, so from your perspectives, how do you see the collaborative landscape in our ecosystem, the bioinnovation community in Canada? So Anybody can... wanna 
Go I can begin. <laughs> Um, so as we often discuss with our pan-Canadian uh, partner, which is a bio-enterprise corporation, maybe you know um, you know them, the ag tech industry, for the ag tech part of the industry of bioeconomy, uh, is currently like 10 different countries, so uh, 10 different uh, industries, sorry. So we have to work uh, more together. And uh, I think this is the role that bio-enterprise um, take uh, last year and um, they want to help this collaboration uh, between province. Uh, for our part, the priority was to structure the industry in Quebec. In Quebec, this is a particular um, place, as you know, because we are um, we are a lot of French person. So uh, the first part was to uh, structure the industry, and now that it is done. We are uh, increasingly collaborating with the bio enterprise to create a relationship with other uh, Canadian ecosystem because there is an ecosystem um, for each province uh, or an average of. We also create four other international corridor last year. Yes, last year. Sorry. So in the United States, Morocco, France, and the Netherlands. So the the, the goal is to promote the uh, ag tech industry of Quebec, but of Canada too. Awesome. Anyone else? Maybe I'll jump in uh, quick here. Yeah. So I, I, I think we have a ton of the right ingredients in Canada. Like they're just hearing the work here of, of different organizations, right? I think there's really great stuff happening. And I think what's exciting is you're starting to see those barriers broken down. So we have the geography opportunity and the kind of challenge, right? We're so big, um, we're spread out across the country. But now when you're bringing in, you know, um, biotech isn't just health or just, ag, or, you know, looking at the space agency now, I guess, right, is a, a biotech organization as well. And it's really cool the way you described uh, clearly of, of breaking down those silos between different govern, government departments. And I think that's what we're starting to see now and really what we're trying to encourage as an organization to to bring together different groups, I think. And and uh, and because you, you don't really know where the collaboration opportunities are, are going to come from. And I think now with the kind of platform technology you know, a company that can be developing. I mean, we see it uh, within the health space for COVID vaccines, right? A company that's developing a cancer therapeutic now is delivering COVID vaccines, right? And I think you can see that cross sector too. I think spaces like cell ag, um, where, you know, stem cell biologists are looking at how do we culture animal cells to make meat, right? So I think that's, I think where we have a lot of those different pieces in Canada. And I think it's just, uh, it's going to take that kind of always striving for for collaboration and trying to see where are the opportunities across the country and internationally i think the way you said mary lou too really really important because we're we're still a small place right so how do we make sure that our ecosystem is connected uh, to other countries yeah I'll, I'll add to that um and i want to give a shout out as well to district three and uh, montreal new tech who have been doing that in the ecosystem here in quebec uh for number of years and are doing really great and this kind of conference that they're holding today is really helping to break some of the silos um and my background is not in bio innovation or biotech at all but i can see a similar type of model being replicated in different uh topics and i think this idea of uh tr whether it's tri-sector and uh private public and social and within social of course there's academics and universities but building links between these different sectors that usually talk a different language, just different ways of working, uh, different ways of understanding, uh, giving contracts or starting a project and uh, understanding and having actors of change in all of these sectors uh, and in the community, like with District 3 and Montreal New Tech, uh, to help do the translation between the actors is what really helps to build the barriers. Um, then in terms of the private, uh, the public sector, so we, sorry, we're trying to do our part. And I think the open innovation approaches like challenge prizes help to really break down some of the barriers uh, that are usually in place. Um, providing grants or contributions or even a contract in the government is not as straightforward as it can be as in the private sector. And so um, the, for example, Impact Canada has spe specific um, rules that we can use to enable uh, challenge prizes and uh, giving rewards to startups or even any Canadian that's interested in solving a problem 
in different ways. And so I think that kind of practices uh, apply to a field that's trying to become more mainstream is super important to really connect the actors and make sure that we're going forward. So um, this is how we start. And I hope that we'll uh, keep pushing the, the field forward because Canada has a lot to gain. Awesome. Do any of you have any ideas or suggestions about how we could improve the collaboration in the ecosystem? No pressure. Well, more connection and more like not being afraid to build the links between the companies and uh, daring new things as big companies or uh, government entities also learn to work differently, work with um, startups, uh, work with organizations like District 3 who help break down the barriers, I think it's important to take a leap of faith and sometimes try things that have not been tried before, uh, except that it might not always result in a positive success or sometimes it's just an experiment, but having that experimental mindset is important for things to move ahead, I think. I totally, I totally agree with you, I think, you know, Research is risky, right? It often doesn't work, but even if your initial experiment or, or project or whatever you're planning doesn't work, it doesn't mean the connections and the results you got won't lead to somewhere unexpected. So I think that definitely is a role, I think, for the public sector too, is to take on some of that risk for the private sector, right? And look at, at new areas that are, you know, what we're talking about here is pretty out there for a lot of people, I think, right? So, um, but looking at that, that's that's where it's going. And I think when you do look at the amount of capital that's going into these types of efforts in other places in the world. I think we do need to support that kind of more out there um, type work with different mixes of, of stakeholders and, and companies and academics and so on. But it does seem like Canada is moving in, in, in that direction. I think we recognize, you know, the old model of physical sciences over here, health sciences over here and so on doesn't work. We need to, to break that down. So we are making progress. And, uh, and like you said, clearly, we have to start somewhere. Right. So I think now we, we start and we keep trying to push that. <laughs> Awesome. So as you guys know, Canada doesn't yet have a national strategy for bioengineering and other countries like can like the US, the UK, Germany, Australia, they've developed these strategies and they're out there for, for all to see. So Jordan, I guess my question for you is, if not through a national strategy, what ways could we uh, increase the op funding opportunities for startups in Canada in this space? Yeah, I think I think a national strategy is needed and and a, or at least a roadmap to guide and I think not to be prescriptive but to kind of say here's the kind of goals where we should be moving towards and then let people kind of self assemble to go and meet those, right? I think we can't be, you know, I, I like strategy and you you know, you can think you can kind of move everything around and get it just right and it's going to work. It's not how real life works, right? So I think trying to set some goals and look where should Canada play and so on is needed. I think on the startup side of your question, I think we need to look for where can they get support, um, you know, efforts like Creative Destruction Lab are great at, at helping startups and uh, we're attracting international companies that want to participate in that. And there's a number of uh, biotech engineering biology companies in there. And I think for our startup companies too, looking at international sources of money as well. Um, I think especially with COVID now, it doesn't necessarily matter where your company is. It's about what's the opportunity, right? So we tried to pilot some programs. Um, at Ontario Genomics working with international accelerators like in the Bay Area to help companies go down, attend. Um, and, and there, the, the checks that they'll write for basically an idea, you know, $250,000 US because you have a compelling team and a cool idea, that's hard to get in Canada. So I think taking advantage of that um, is, is one strategy. As long as we don't lose our companies, we got to make sure that they come back and they they stay here. But I, I, I'd put that as a, a caveat on, on how we access international international funding. Perhaps as a follow-up to that, I'd, I'd like to ask, so as you know, there's a lot of different initiatives now uh, emerging in Canada. So just to name a few, there's SynBio Canada, obviously CanDesign, SynBridge, the BioHub, um, CSBerg, which is the Synthetic Biology Education Research Group, and CGEM as well. So with all these initiatives, having um, you know overlapping visions and values, but still filling unique gaps in the ecosystem, do you think that, well, I guess, what could we do to make sure that everyone's moving in the same direction and to maximize the collaborative potential across these players? 
that's if you don't have an answer, anyone else could hop on that as well. Is that direct? Was that directed at me? I, I can I can go quick. I think on that, and I'm sure others will have uh, something to add on it. I think you know we we can focus on the organizations that are interested in engineering biology, and it's it's great that we have those. We need lots of that. I think in the ecosystem, we need lots of organizations, given the breadth of um, the sectors and geography and so on. I think it will take a lot of players, and there are a lot of players in the different verticals. So I think that's that's an okay thing. It's how do you coordinate? And I think maybe the challenge model or kind of vision setting um, with a roadmap is the way to help people kind of be going in the same direction. But I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you. So my next question is for you, Clelia. How do you see the challenges created by Impact Canada contributing to advancing the bioinnovation ecosystem here? Um, well, it really depends on uh, the kind of uh, government departments that want to work with Impact Canada. So um, it either depends on uh, budgets or strategies that the government wants to put forward. But um, Impact Canada actually serves different government departments. So it would have to come from uh, a government um, department itself with a certain budget to work on a specific problem. But I think there is room for influencing uh, sometimes some of these um, priorities. So if there is a strong interest and shown and pushed, I'm hoping that there will be uh, challenges that work specifically on uh, the biotech industry in the next couple of years. Excellent. All right, so I see that we have some questions uh, from the audience. I'm going to take this one. So I guess this is for all of you. What is what is your vision for the Canadian bioeconomy over the next 10 years? Anyone want to take a stab at that first? It will have to have a clear strategy, I think, to um, to uh, propel the industry uh, because um, I think uh, the bioeconomy is uh, well started but a lot of industries a lot of uh, big player have to um, take a, a deeper lead a deeper action into uh, that uh, sector um, this is a relatively young industry too so so we have to to lead it um, a step uh, beyond and um, i hope that um, a lot of um, more um, we, we, a lot of uh, industry that are more um, uh, environmental issue uh, will uh, go deeper with bioeconomy and bio biomass and uh, uh, package green packaging etc. So uh, to to have a deeper um, uh, a deeper um, <clears throat> sorry um, impact on uh, on green uh, on the greenhouse uh, gas. Anyone else want to share their 10 year vision for the Canadian bioinnovation ecosystem? Jordan, I'll let you jump in because my background is not specifically in biotech, so I'll let you take that one. Sure. It's, it's a little bit like the question in an interview, where do you see yourself in five years kind of, right? Um, it's, uh, it's tough, but I think, you know, there, there was a report published recently uh, by McKinsey on the bio revolution. And I think that kind of gives a picture of what are we going to be like in the world or what could be in between 2030 and 2040. So that's a two to $4 trillion bioeconomy driven by engineering biology and biotech. And uh, you know, up to 60% of the world's physical inputs being made from biomass basically through, through um, means of, of biomanufacturing. So I'd say a vision for Canada is if that's where the world is going, we need to have our percentage basically, right? And even that two to $4 trillion and what's Canada's economy uh, relative to the, to the world, right? I think that's, that's the goal, I think, because if that's where people are going, and that is kind of the audacious kind of vision that I think other countries are pushing, we need to we need to be there. And you see this; it's it's going to be fueled by things like you know, um, depending on what happens in the U.S. with Biden's uh, two trillion dollar plan, there's going to be significant investment, I think, to really remake the economy and remake traditional industries. And I think for for Canada, I think that's where we'd, we'd want to see that. You know, our food processing sector is enabled by biotech, and we're, you know, we have products like Cell Ag and and uh, increased uh, plant-based type protein products out there. Um, our traditional ag sector, we have, you know, enabled by biotech continued growth. I think we want to see 
But what I'd like is not to see disruption and see our old industries kind of moved aside for biotech, but see these traditional industries basically lifted up and pushed by biotech so that we take advantage of all of our industry strength and all of our skills and so on that we have in these sectors. So hopefully that will uh, come true. It's pretty, pretty rosy, but hopefully that will come true. <laughs> awesome. Thank you all. Okay. One more question from the audience. What can the general public, so students and researchers, do to get involved in the bio bioeconomy? Any takers? Um, maybe from the, the Impact Canada slash uh, CSA side, I would say that um, the challenge approach is very open uh, to new innovators and you don't have to have a company, have credentials. Uh, as long as you're able to create a Canadian legal entity, uh, anyone can apply. So um, if you're interested widely in the spectrum of food and new food production innovations, uh, it can really apply to anyone. And so uh, sometimes a competition like this doesn't have, uh, you can always give it a shot and um, you don't have to have huge credentials to get started. And there's some good track record of um, people and companies that were not uh, the usual suspects uh, and gave a shot to their solution and, and uh, created some really amazing products. So um, I think that's the first way uh, if I talk for the, the Canadian government, uh, but I'll let Marilou and Jordan complete that answer. Thank you, Kailia. So for our part, uh, as, as uh, we see in the uh, ecosystem in Quebec, a lot of researchers are uh, involved in the bioeconomy for sure, because this is the the future. Um, for the part of the students, uh, the students we have um, my tax. I think uh, each province has that a my tax that can uh, um, give um, uh, funding to um, to for for. for to, to, to get students into the research and the development of the technology. Um, and um, what we do at the Zone Act Tech um, is uh, to, um, what we, we did and what we do uh, the, la the last year is to uh, <clears throat> organize programs so, uh, and um, an innovation program where researchers are there to uh, search her, um, uh, research center, etc., to to uh, give the the best, uh, the, the next uh, technologies and the best, uh, uh, the last uh, research on uh, a subject. And uh, students are there, and we um, we build um, some relationship between companies and students and searcher and uh, scientists to uh, develop the new technology. So there is a good collaboration now. Uh, we can do more. But uh, uh, actually, uh, I think uh, there is a, uh, they are involved in the bioeconomy. Awesome. I, I want to just give also a shout out here, similar to my taxes, BioTalent, uh, which also has a booth in the expo, but they've also uh, invested a lot in, in this space, obviously, in, in developing students and trainees. This next question is for Jordan. So Jordan, as part of Ontario Genomics, um, you know, obviously there's also Genome Quebec and Genome Canada and, and the other um, genome centers. Can you explain to us how these organizations work together and how this can work to help unify the bioeconomy ecosystem? Sure, yeah, so just for super quick background, um, you know, in, about 20 years ago now, um, Genome Canada was established in Ottawa and then regional genome centers across Canada were established and that model was really meant to be kind of centralized funding and then boots on the ground looking at what are the regional differences and connecting to regional stakeholders and i think i think it still works today so we really try to use that model and you know our work in um, kind of pushing engineering biology across canada from the beginning we started with kind of the grassroots conferences and workshops and, and involved every center um, in, in in those events in terms of identifying you know where are the research strengths in those different provinces who can you know be connected into that and invited and so on so we've tried to use that that model i think because we are like we talked about earlier in the panel we're we're a big country and every province has its differences so i think this is a good model to uh to look at i think facilitating collaboration and and trying to reach different groups because it's it's i mean these types of events are great because you can find out about what different people are doing but we need other mechanisms too to find 
how do we connect into kind of initiatives in different provinces and roll that up into the kind of national thinking, I guess, so. Awesome. Okay, I have a question for Mary Lou. So which two to three subsectors in the bioinnovation uh, economy do you see booming in Canada in the next few years? Good, perfect. Thank you, Samir. So for the ag tech industry, uh, part the booming on the demand side, so not uh, on the industry side, supply side, comes from uh, greenhouses and the market gardening sector, actually, uh, a lot. The greenhouse sector is currently well funded by the, go the Quebec government. Maybe you, you know that because the Prime of Quebec wants to increase food autonomy through greenhouse production, especially in winter. But uh, here, many greenhouses have also labor shortage issues, so it is really hard to produce. Um, so there is currently a great demand for technology that allow greenhouse production 12 uh, months a year. Uh, in the most of it automated way as possible. So intelligent uh, HVAC system, AI lightning system, intelligent sorting system, and et cetera. Mm. In the market, uh, gardening and various sectors, demand comes mainly from a uh, challenge uh, of the lack of manpower and climate change. So all the technology that make it possible to robotize tasks in the field are closely watched. Uh, as well as those that make it possible to carry out um, precision farming and water access. And on the other side, on the supply side in Quebec, there is a trend towards the development of what's called farming systems, uh, which allows production in a controlled uh, environment, uh, environment way, sorry. Uh, and these technology are very interesting, as you know, for the Versailles uh, a country's production and reducing imports. And eventually in this system, we will be able to produce uh, several varieties of fruit and vegetables, including perhaps superfood and plants uh, for biocosmetic, nutraceutical, and even bases for vaccines. Uh, because uh, last year, among others, some of our members have decided to focus on this aspect during the pandemic. And finally, other sectors are also grooming, growing, such as mushroom uh, cultivation, insect, green packaging, and indoor fish farming, as I told you earlier. So the ag technology sector is currently changing a lot and give big possibilities for the bioeconomy, as you know. Hmm. And as a follow-up to that, is there any particular subsector? It could be agri-food related or otherwise that really interests and excites you, Meredith? Is there, Sorry? That, is there one particular application or set of applications that really excites you? Uh, um, for my part, I am um, really focused on uh, climate change. So uh, all the technology that give a solution for uh, the adaptation of ag sector to climate change. Um, I think this is the, the most important. Uh, uh, so uh, water access, um, uh, precision farming, I think it will be really, really important. Um, soil management. Uh, so uh, this is a lot of technologies. And for an, a, another way, because manpower shortage is really an, an important issue actually in Quebec, um, robot and automated it, automatization, etc. It's really interesting, uh, even if it don't give um, an impact a, a direct impact on uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so we have just enough time for one last question. So this one's for anyone who wants to take it. How might we accelerate positive regulations for new food and new biotech innovations in Canada? Any takers? I can, I can take a start and, uh, and, and see here. I think I would say I think Canada does a pretty good job at this right now. Um, when you look at decisions that have happened around the world, I think we're pretty science based. And I think government is open to looking at where are things going. I mean, we have interactions with government on and, and helping them to understand where are different fields going. And I think I think we learned a little bit maybe too, when you look at say cannabis regulation, being kind of ahead of the curve on regulation can actually drive a lot of investment into an area. So I think, you know, when you look at say countries like Singapore where they approved the first cultured meat, um, chicken chicken uh, nugget, I think, right? In, in Canada, I think, would that make sense, right? Can we can we be ahead to try to, to help to drive um, in investment and support into these new areas? And I think government seems to be open to that. So I think 
staying engaged on where the science is going and things are going so quick now. I think that's the tough thing is keeping up with, you know, where are we going five, 10 years from now? Because it, it's a, the, the kind of cycles are getting shorter and shorter, but I think government's open to that. So I, I think that's pretty positive. Maybe I'll jump in on that and just add the quick uh, space perspective is that there is a lot of innovations that have been, there are, sorry, a lot of innovations that have been created for space that then have uh, and find the wide uh, adoption of the technology here on earth. And uh, in the context of food, uh, we're looking for innovations that range from plant production, aquaculture, bioreactors, bacteria, 3D printing of food, and really anything that can um, come as a new idea to produce food in a safe manner and that will have like a, uh, that will be a, um, that astronauts will want to eat while in space. And so uh, these foods, once we have concepts and we move ahead with uh, the innovations, the idea is that they will, we want them to be applicable and have uh, benefits for earth. And so um, competitions like that, where like the, the room is, the door is open for new innovations, as well as the field of space, which really brings uh, breakthroughs that can then be adopted, can I think be good places to innovate and to push the agenda for new things uh, and and then later get into the regulation question. And clearly I'll, I'll ask you a question after that. So does the CSA have its own in-house research, uh, research base or are you guys strictly collaboration based when it comes to agriculture and health? So it used to uh, have a research base and that was uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, there were a few uh, research experiments and work done, uh, including one, I think on Devon Island, uh, which is in uh, the Northern regions of Canada. And it stopped around uh, the year 2012. And now um, it's thanks to the new Canadian space strategy that uh, food is back on the table, uh, no puns intended. Uh, <laughs> um, it's back on the table and uh, we've been working on a new vision for food production and we actually have a food production initiative team um, within space exploration strategic planning, uh, but it's we're not doing in-house research. So all the work that we're doing is purely based on collaboration. Uh, we just set up a topical team that helps to guide the space agency um, as to like which direction we should take for the next uh, 10 years and more in order to realize our vision uh, and make sure that Canada is one of the major players in terms of food production for space. Awesome. All right. I think that's time. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jordan, Malilu, and Kalilia. And uh, I, I'm excited to see what, what comes next in the event. I'll pass it on to you, Leila. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Uh, merci beaucoup à nos fabuleux panélistes. C'était tellement inspirant. On a parlé de, de nourriture dans l'espace. Le futur de la bioéconomie, c'est... En tout cas, moi, ça m'inspire énormément. J'espère que c'est le même cas pour vous toutes et tous. Alors, on passe à notre prochain sujet qui est le... Vous connaissez déjà maintenant le Biohub. Euh, vous savez que les startups de District 3 euh, qui font partie du Biohub peuvent également appliquer euh, au Concordia Genome Foundry. Et pourquoi je vais vous parler du génome euh, de Concordia Genome Foundry, c'est que c'est le seul endroit qui existe au Canada et parmi les 20 seuls établissements euh, de recherche euh, en génomique au monde. Alors, Gislaine, tu veux aussi nous, nous en dire plus. Ah, Gislaine. Sorry, I was... <laughs> so here I am, sorry. Um, after these two awesome bio talks, let's stretch our legs and get moving. Let's join Vincent Martin, founder of Concordia's Genome Foundry. He's also associate professor in microbiology. Mar uh, Vincent Martin is a Canada researcher in microbial genomics and engineering. And as well, Vincent is the scientific director of District 3. Wow. <laughs> Vince, it's all our, yours. Let's go. Welcome to the Bio Innovation Conference. So I'm, I'm coming to you from the Genome Foundry, which is a unique Canadian core facility, uh, which is used to give services both to academics, private industry, and startups 
uh, to help them develop uh, engineered microbes, uh, such as yeast and, and bacteria, or even engineered stem cells uh, for therapeutics and, and cell therapies. We're fully equipped here to engineer yeast and microbes for various purposes. For example, we can engineer yeast to make uh, chemical compounds that will help us in, in producing greener and more sustainable plastics and polymers. We can actually engineer microbes to produce uh, uh, therapeutic drugs so we can produce them in a more sustainable uh, and a more uh, secure way in Canada so we can actually secure supply chains. We actually engineer stem cells so we have a, an entire end-to-end -end, um, capacity to grow, transform and genetically modified stem cells and all of that with the purpose of developing the next generation of therapies for, for Canadians. And this is a big uh, uh, collaboration that we have with the National Research Council of Canada. Hopefully this will be available in the next five years or so. My name is Nick Gold. I'm the platform manager and, uh, and platform developer here at the microbial side of the foundry where we assemble DNA and high throughput. The throughput that we can achieve in the microbial suite is about a thousand plasmids a week which represents about 50 to 60,000 individual liquid transfers which is a number that you couldn't do by hand of course. So the foundry as a whole is a technology platform that enables scale of your science. So the way that we assemble plasmids uh, here in the foundry, so the pipeline really uh, happens with these three workstations all around me. The first one being the Inspire automated integrated workstation, which is really just a robot arm that moves experiment plates from one robot to another as part of this uh, work cell. And all the work is orchestrated by a central scheduling software. Over here, we'll assemble your DNA, make your plasmids. And then once the, once the plasmids are, are assembled, your putative plasmids will be put into cells here on this uh, automated liquid handler, which is a biomech. We put them into cells and then plate them onto solid medium and then let them grow up overnight. And then the next day, this automated colony picker will pick single colonies. Uh, and each individual colony may or may not have your correctly assembled DNA, so we need to check that. Uh, and to do that, we come back to the Inspire workstation for genotyping and QC. This station has a, a fragment analyzer an automated fragment analyzer and a QPCR, so QC happens in an automated way. But once your plasmas are QC'd, we'll send them off for sequencing, and if they come back with the correct sequences and those plasmids may or may not be destined for transfection into mammalian cells, we'll send them over to the mammalian suite, where Smitha will tell you how that works. Hello, I'm Smitha Amarnath, the platform coordinator at the Concordia Genome Foundry. Having established the microbial suite, the focus on mammalian genome engineering is a natural extension of our collaborators, the National Research Council of Canada, NRC, provided a foundational investment to develop and set up an automated mammalian genome engineering platform. Leveraging our expertise and experience in microbial gene editing and cell culture, we are developing an automated mammalian genome engineering platform. Our initial focus is to develop the mammalian chassis by running proof of concept experiments and generating novel gene editing tools for precision genome engineering in mammalian cells or any user defined cells. The overall goal of the mammalian suite at the Concordia Genome Foundry is to accelerate innovation and discovery cycles in the gene and cell therapies for regenerative medicine and immunotherapies like CAR-T. The genome editing platform would help us engineer therapeutic abilities into the user-defined cells and these user-defined cells can then be used as treatment modalities for degenerative diseases as well as cancer. To know more about this and join us in this exciting endeavor, please meet Benjamin Scott at the Expo starting right after this. Thank you. Wow, c'est très impressionnant. C'est d'habitude des expériences qui prennent des mois euh, et qui se font maintenant de manière automatisée. Alors, comme Smita vient de, de le mentionner, vous pouvez vous joindre dans quelques minutes euh, pour en apprendre plus sur le Genome Foundry à l'expo euh, qui se trouve juste là.
Yeah, and for the virtual expo, we have gathered organizations that will help and support you throughout your journey. We have 10 different booths. Whether you are a professional, scientist, or a startup, uh, there are many resources for you. So have a look. We will have BioTalent Canada, Fundica, R&D Partners, uh, the Genome Foundry, QCSC, MyTax, IndieBio, District 3, V1 Studio. So many, many different organizations that can support your access to talent, funding, training, labs, and, and resources. Oui, merci Giselaine. Alors, comme Giselaine le dit, je vais le répéter en français, mais là, vous avez vraiment accès, comme vous le voyez dans l'écran, à plein de boots. Donc, c'est des ressources, euh, des personnes que vous pouvez rencontrer. Ils sont là, ils vous attendent. Il euh, y, y a tout ce qu'il vous faut pour euh, vous soutenir dans votre parcours. Alors, vraiment, n'hésitez pas à aller euh, visiter. Vous pouvez juste cliquer dessus et aller dans les différents boots. Donc, euh, comme Giselaine vient de le mentionner, euh, on a vraiment plein d'organisations euh, géniales qui sont avec nous aujourd'hui. On voudrait vraiment aussi les remercier pour leur présence et on a hâte que vous créez des connexions juste là-bas tous ensemble. Yeah, and at the same time at the expo, we will have networking opportunities in the form of speed datings. So the speed datings will be three minutes each, but you can extend it if you want. To enter the networking session, click on networking and ready. Yes. So the expo and networking will be on and open until 3 p.m. After the networking and expo, we will invite startups, students, and professionals to stick around for our workshop sessions. The links are here to participate in the Zoom platform as well. So the first workshop will be with Huda Javar. He is, sorry, she is District 3's instructional designer. Um, and she will lead the workshop for startups named Attracting Agents of Change, recruiting for the bioeconomy sessions. The second workshop. Uh, the second one will be. Yeah. Alexandra Allen, uh, it will be in English, but I will say it in French. Donc, Alexandra, notre facilitatrice de talent à District 3, elle dirigera l'atelier destiné aux personnes qui cherchent en ce moment un travail dans la bioéconomie, intitulé « Faire bonne impression, affiner votre histoire professionnelle pour un emploi dans la bioéconomie ». Donc, uh, un atelier dont on a vraiment besoin. Vous avez le lien Zoom uh, et vous pouvez, que vous allez retrouver dans le chat dans quelques secondes. And finally, after the uh, expo, the networking session and the two workshops, we will close for, uh, for the day after such a long uh, time of uh, excitement and uh, such interesting debate that we will have had and we have more in, uh, coming up. And we will resume tomorrow at midday for some more panels, tech spotlights, workshops, networking, and much more. Merci, Justine. Alors, rendez-vous à l'expo dès maintenant. Euh, profitez du réseautage avec les participants et les participantes de la bio-innovation. Euh, Justine et moi, euh, on a bien hâte de vous revoir demain en pleine forme pour une journée passionnante. Alors, on vous souhaite de très belles connexions. À demain et prenez soin de vous. Bye. Bye, everyone.